This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Welcome to our special program, 2023 China Looking Ahead. I am Kate Kui. Well, today we will focus on the new energy sector development. China has been taking global leadership in the renewable energy sector, where it is currently the world's largest producer of wind and solar energy and the largest domestic and outbound investor in renewable energy. Four of the world's five biggest renewable energy deals were made by Chinese companies as early as in 2016. And now China owns five of the world's six largest solar module manufacturing companies and the world's largest wind turbine manufacturer. Well, reducing air pollution is a direct reason why Chinese government promote renewable energy. Well, and China's uh, commitment is, um, and Chinese commitment to support the development of renewable energy comes at a time when the United States administration is reducing federal funding for environmental research. Well, China has been taking lead in a sector to mitigate the side effect caused by industrialization and globalization. Well, in 2022, China expansion in solar and wind power put it on track to hit 3,000 terawatt hours of clean energy electricity generation and far more than any other country in the world and lifted the share of clean energy in China's electricity mix to a national record of 31.9%. Now, as we enter into 2023, how will the sector perform and what are the trends and how will the global renewable energy sector and ecosystem evolve? Today, we're very happy to have several guests joining us from all across the globe, sharing with us their insights. Um, they are Henning Shu's vice president from JA Solar, um, and also Lan Tian Shi, co-CEO of GCL Technology Holdings, and um, Matthew Zhao, who is the managing director of Bank of America Securities, who oversees renewable energy sector research, and Ma Jun, director of the Institute of Public and Environmental Affairs. And we will also take video um, of the interviews that are previously recorded with uh, several renowned experts in the field. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, let me ask um, you this question first. There are many rounds of ups and downs in the renewable energy sector development in China since 2000. So how is this round of the development different from previous rounds? Uh, Matty, why don't I start from you first? Sure, thanks, uh, Kate, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we believe these rounds, there are three major differences. Firstly, we are seeing a clearer target. Secondly, a full value chain participation. So thirdly, uh, improved technology. So looking at the first one, clearer China targets, um, President Xi uh, set up uh, that China wants to achieve uh, carbon neutrality by 2060. This announcement was made in late 2020. Following that, um, we are also seeing in the 14th five-year plan, China set a new target that renewable energy should account for 20% of primary energy mix by right. 2025. And China also plans to have 1,200 gigawatt of combined solar and wind energy capacity by 2030 as well. Following Beijing's clear target, provincial level government also set their own clear and long-term goals as well. Meanwhile, according to Bank of America analysis, China boasted the strongest performance in the public policy uh, among all the Asia countries. Um, and for most of the, much of the decades, China represents 40 percent of all environmental focused government policy in Asia region and accumulated investment has exceeded 170 billion dollars as well. Right. Secondly, uh, about the full value chain participation, we see this uh, carbon neutrality is a very challenging goal, and the net zero can only be achieved by full value chain engagement. Mm -hmm. um, given that majority of the CO2 emission are coming from power, steel, cement, and um, all these downstream segments as well. Right. So we need the downstream to participate together with the upstream. So some example we are seeing after the uh, the pledge by President Xi is, for example, Bao Steel kick off the construction of pilot Zhejiang uh, one million ton hydro bay, hydrogen based uh, shaft furnace project. Mm -hmm. In addition, we are also seeing a lot of the aluminum producers doing right. that as well. Right. Thirdly, about technology, 
we are actually seeing um, the overall cost of uh, renewable energy more, uh, much lower and more economical as well. Um, for example, in the past decade, the, uh, due to the innovative technology, the cost of PV has dropped by 90%. The cost of wind power has dropped 25 to 40 percent, and the cost of energy storage has dropped by more than 80 percent as well. Right. Because of the lower cost, it also makes the application of this renewable energy uh, easier and also uh, uh, quicker as well. Great. Thank you. Uh, Back to you, yeah, Kate. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, um, um, that's a very comprehensive wrap-up. Ma Jun, what is your take um, on the difference this, um, this time? Uh, in terms of renewable energy sector development. Um, as what Matty said, apparently, you know, the entry barrier is much higher. Um, you know, the industry is, is much more mature compared to last round. That's right. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with, uh, well, with, with the guests. Um, uh, and I just want to add that uh, in this round, um, it's uh, going to be led more uh, by, the, uh, by the policy target and uh, in China, it's, uh, it's mentioned uh, that China set up a very ambitious target on renewable energy uh, in the 14th five-year plan, according to the uh, to the central government planning, uh, right. the uh, installation capacity uh, on the on the on the wind side needs to be increased by 300 gigawatts. gigawatts. And uh, uh, toward the end of last year, there's still more than 65 percent of uh, uh, of gap there so there there are a very big uh, policy uh, space for that and uh, in the meantime of course uh, in this round the uh, we uh, we have uh, we have a change in covid policy and uh, chinese uh, china is going to end this three year um, uh, covid focus and uh, uh, focus uh, uh, on the again on the economy so I think this, this is going to be very, very uh, favorable. And uh, in the meantime, uh, this is going to be powerful. And in the meantime, we, uh, we are seeing that uh, the, uh, the last several rounds, uh, some of them are uh, motivated by the, by the government subsidy, uh, like 2020 and, uh, uh, and, and then 2021 on the offshore uh, wind, so wind power. Uh, it's uh, it's more about subsidy, but but this time, there's no kind of subsidy. It's more, as the guest uh, mentioned, uh, that it's more uh, due to the uh, maturity of our of of, uh, of our supply chain of uh, of the whole industry right. and also the development of technology. Right. So people are really buying into this idea. Earlier, I also spoke to two industry insiders. Um, one is Henning Shoes, who is the vice president from JA Solar. And the second guest was Cao Zhigang, who is the president of Goldwind, which is a wind turbine making company, manufacturing company. And let's hear what they say. Power industry. China started our journey of wind power development since 1985. It's been three decades already. In the first stage, it was purely about introducing the international equipment and products, and Chinese companies were responsible for power generation and operation. And almost 100% of the equipment were from the European companies. And in 1985, when we embarked on the journey of scientific and technological Invention, innovation, we started to develop the wind power industry and we started the localization, but we were still exploring. And then, 10 years later, under the leadership of the Ministry of Science and Technology, many SOEs started to turn to the localization of the power sector. And uh, it was growing very fast in those years. The first turning point happened in 2006, when the law on renewable energy was promulgated because it was finally justified legally. And since then, 
Our industry has entered into the first golden period from 2006 to 2011. The growth rate was annually 100 percent. And on that same year, the installed capacity of wind power was 18 million kilowatts. Compared to the past two decades, that one year's installed capacity was the total of the previous decades. So, First of all, um, as everybody knows, the whole PV industry has uh, developed very fast over the last, um, let's say, roughly 20 years. Um, so just looking at, at it from a scale perspective, um, the new round is very different because um, the new additions we are talking about just in absolute terms of, of gigawatt peak um, are much bigger than um, what we saw in, in previous um rounds of, uh, of big steps of new new development. Mm -hmm. um, since the industry is now so big or has a certain size and obviously will grow a lot um, still in the future, and we will see new rounds of development as the current one also in the future, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, but since the industry is now much bigger, um, well, first of all, the threshold to really be a new entrant into the industry is also higher than it used to be. So um, for new entrants, um, it is more difficult to now come into the industry than it was, which um, then, of course, favors the companies already active in the industry. Um, so you can also see that you know a lot of the uh, new investments done currently um, are done by companies um, who have already been been acting in PV. Also, such a new round of development will likely not um, really, you know, lead to new um, major companies. But the ones who are already leading uh, will also keep uh, keep being the leading leading companies uh, in the industry after this, uh, you know, new round of development, new new round of um, of investment. And finally, right. what's, what's very different is that um, the demand is uh, much more foreseeable um, mm. because um, a lot of governments, um, such as the EU, such as the US government, such as the Chinese government, Japan, they've all set their targets for carbon react re reduction, even um, carbon neutrality. Um, and this is leading to a demand, of course, also thanks to the price um, decrease we've seen in the last years, which is more organic than it used to be. So it's less pos uh, less uh, dependent on policies. Therefore, um, the whole new um, additions to production capacity are now falling into a net, which is made of more organic and less policy-driven demand than in the past. Great. So we are definitely entering into a new phase of development in this sector. Uh, Lan Zong, Ning Hao, uh, I think your feeling should be similar to those of the two guests. Just like we have entered a new phase of development, we have entered a new phase of development. 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 We have entered a new phase of 的速度，呃，最重要的一点是，比如说明年哈，因为今年整个受到疫情的影响很大，明年我们会不会出现就这个装机量不达预期的啊、呃、这种可能性？不管是出于什么样的原因。Um, 让我很快的来翻译一下哈，给我们海外的观众。Um, so basically, expected new installation of solar um, capacity will reach 140 gigawatts in 2023 as street estimates from uh, what is what was 87 gigawatts last year. Now, with all those numbers increasing, how should we project the new energy sector growth in the next five years time, especially in the solar sector in particular? Um, do we really have the risk of installation number falling short of expectation um, in the solar sector? 嗯，首先，光伏经过了多年的这个行业的发展 ，PV industry has undergone a lot. And the 2021 could be set as the beginning year, before which time PV development was capped by many new energy policies in other countries. For example, the subsidies amount. 
Those policies will determine the supply amount of PV, but since 2020, the power generation cost of PV was lower than that of fossil fuels. That's why we witnessed that since 2020, the PV industry has undergone very fast growth. And the CAG is about 35 percent annually. And also, there have been some bottlenecks for the PV industry to develop, especially when it's moving towards more cost-effective development trend. And such a bottleneck may be relieved since 2023. For example, the bottleneck concerning the waste may be relieved a great deal since 2023. In the future, with higher manufacturing capacity at all ends of PV, the cost of power generation from PV will be much lower. And more efficient magnetic technology will be applied into the whole PV system. So in the future, the cost of power generation from PV will, in the future, be the most competitive choice. It will further contribute to the global power generation cost reduction. It will render better services. Um, right. Um, Matty, do you agree with what uh, Lan Zong just mentioned? Actually, he raised two very interesting points. First of all, it's definitely the silicon price. Uh, now, with this uh, price coming down, how do you see uh, this impacting the market, um, especially the uh, module uh, manufacturers um, in 2023 and going forward? This is one. And secondly, how likely do you see the installation number falling short um, in this coming year, 2023? Sure, thanks, uh, Kate. Um, yes, for the uh, solar PV, it's the largest cost component uh, is the in the manufacturing, and we believe that uh, seven, uh, seventy percent of the costs will be on on the uh, raw material side um, as well um, for for these uh, polysilicons. Uh, also, um, uh, some of the other raw materials like uh, steel and aluminum prices, we are also seeing them coming down from a very high level at the beginning of last year. Right. Um, so uh, we forecast silicon supply to rise for about 43% in 2022 and another 64% in 2023. Um, we believe that this will be sufficient to turn the sectors from a shortage to a, over, uh, to a surplus in 2023 as well. We are also forecasting the uh, polysilicon AST to drop from uh, the currently 170 RMB per kg, uh, kg to about 80 uh, RMB per kg by the end of uh, 2023 as well. And also with uh, some other raw materials like aluminum, like steel, also price getting more stabilized as well. That would also help um, the manufacturing cost and also become more competitive for the solar power generation as well. Um, for your second question, overall, we are expecting the uh, solar capacity to increase by about 25% um, mm -hmm. in 2023. We are also expecting uh, the wind uh, capacity to grow for about 18% for uh, uh, 2023 as well. Thank you. Right. Um, so, you know, with the, the situation you just described, are we foreseeing a price war in the sector, in the solar sector especially? Um, or is the pricing, is the price war is already on the road? Uh, I think the uh, I think the oversupply or the price war is already on the road. Um, you can see actually the PV prices have been dropping very fast. Um, and we are actually seeing this actually in the long run beneficiary for the renewable energies, given it will provide them a much better uh, cost competitiveness. On the same time, the fossil fuel, like for example, for coal and oil prices have been hiking a lot. Like take coal as an example, the coal prices hiked from 500 RMB two years ago to now uh, to last year average of 1,003. Uh, so the cost of power generation uh, from coal-fired power is also getting higher and similar to gas as well. 
So we do believe that uh, uh, this uh, two-way movement, uh, uh, both for the uh, the solar power and also the coal-fired power, is providing a better uh, long-term opportunity for the solar power generation. Right, uh, Lan Zong, you think the solar power war is now in front of you? I should say it should not be called a price war right now because the relationship between supply and demand will determine. The profitability of all parties. In the previous years, silicon sector has reaped the biggest profit, and as to components, they reap less profits. But in the future, profits will move more towards the intermediate levels. Because future, we have to rely on quality instead of uh, the supply of those raw materials. So price war is not a very accurate name to define the future because um, after all, speaking of uh, PV power generation, to deliver the less costly right, um, electricity. Our the guest um, Henning Shoes from J Solar also gave us his insights. Let's take a listen. No, there will not be a situation like in the internet sector because uh, frankly the um, antitrust regulations uh, for manufacturers like us are more more mature and obviously the business models don't differ as much as uh, the ones from from some internet platforms either um, right. so first of all you know what i foresee is that um, the leading companies in terms of the leading module manufacturers they will keep growing faster than the market, meaning um, JA as the other, you know, few leading ones, we will keep growing market share. Um, I also would not really call what we are seeing now a price war. I would call it currently that the bubble is coming out of the supply chain because we all know right. um, Silicon prices are coming down, and this is the main main reason for the current um, module prices or for the current uh, fall decrease of the module prices. Therefore, and this may be even seen as something healthy because uh, we all know the cost of the silicon manufacturers. We all know where the silicon prices were in Q4 last year. Now seeing it fall um, is kind of a normalization in my eyes and not so much really, really a price war. Um, so I think, you know, what we are currently seeing is not so worrying, to be honest, um, uh -huh. but again, more a sign of, of uh, normalization. Right, our entrepreneurs are always very optimistic. So Ma Jing, let me ask you this question. Um, there are apparently very important two points. One is the scale and the second one is technology. Um, Longji just announced it's um, the largest scale expan expansion about a day ago in their public announcement. Um, apparently scale will bring more economics in this industry. And second one is technology. Now we do have a debate of HJT and Topcom. So uh, let me get your take on these two questions. How to avoid um, this industry or this uh, technology um, uh, being over commoditized and this is one and secondly in your view which um, technology will take the lead going forward HDAT or Topcom? Yeah thank you for the question and I, uh, I do think that um, uh, scale is, uh, is important uh, in this you know the uh, scale of the economy and uh, the scale with the, with, with the uh, proper scale uh, the investment uh, on uh, on the uh, technology uh, development uh, uh, could be uh, a lot more in, uh, assured uh, you know with longji you know they have paid uh, uh, they have made um, enormous investment uh, on the technological technological uh, uh, research and um, uh, as a result uh, managed to lead the global uh, efforts uh, to drive down the cost of, uh, of of solar panel or the solar module, and um, uh, so it's uh, it's really really um, uh, helpful not just in China but uh, uh, but globally. So, so I do think that um, you know to have the have the scale is uh, is uh, extremely important, and um, I'm happy to see that uh, uh, that they enjoy the uh, government. Uh, Policy to you know the government recognized the importance of uh, 
uh, of this uh, uh, industry, the renewable uh, energy industry, as a, as a new growth point, and uh, with the new recognition, you know, new kind of a, uh, renewed uh, uh, announcement, you know, statement about the importance of uh, of the private uh, uh, private economy uh, in China's overall development. Uh, uh, I think this uh, is going to further, uh, hopefully, further help. Uh, this industry to grow in a in a healthier way. Right. Um, the technology side, HJT uh, versus Topcom, which one do you prefer? Yeah, I think the um, uh, we have seen that uh, uh, Longji and uh, uh, have uh, have managed to uh, uh, to produce in a more uh, efficient way, and I do think that uh, that technology can be helpful. Right. Um, so, Lan Zong, you think that now, from this technology side, ah, the batteries, the next generation, ah, have HJT, and also have Topcon. Ah, this seems to be a bit like the old Dongjing and Danjing technology path. In your opinion, which technology path will win? Ah, will win in terms of efficiency? Ah, that in this rapid process, how do you balance the two technologies? Ah, 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 how do you balance the two same question uh, on the technology side. Um, the next generation technology, HJT versus Topcom, from his uh, view, his experience, which one will take the lead in the future? Be it HJT or Topcom, they both will be more efficient than the current pork. If judging by investment per GWAT, in this two years, top companies' investment has been declining, and many investors are choosing Topcom right now. In 2023, there may be two gigawatts coming from Topcom to be marketed. So at this time point, in the future, I believe Topcom will have the upper hand to dominate this market. If calculated by orders, for example, Topcom's orders of a monocrystal silicon, it occupies about 30% of the total in my company, and that ratio was less than 5% before. And with this transitioning in place, the efficiency will increase by one percentage point. And as to cost per watt, that is quite advantageous. So I may in favor of Topcom era in the next two to three years. It will replace the P golden years. And Topcom in the future will generate more conversion of the power. Of course, there will be a ceiling and limitation in the future. But we have technological advancement and uh, its total size will increase. So with uh, less investment per unit, it's uh, Matthew, what is your take on this uh, very important technology route? Um, you know, we the, the choice might decide um, who will be the next generation winner. Uh, Longji, for instance, uh, they went out from last round competition because they chose the uh, monosilicon, um, you know, uh, technology route. Uh, but this time, HJT or Topcon choice might also decide uh, who's going to um, take a bigger win um, in this competition. So, from your uh, interviews with all those entrepreneurs, from your experiences, um, what is your what is what is your thoughts? Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Kate. Um, I would say that both of the technology uh, have its pros and cons, uh, but uh, just like what Lan Zhong said, I think it's very depending also on the uh, conversion and also on the cost and also on how committed the um, uh, companies are. Uh, on on those technology. Thank you. Right. Um, so um, it seems that we still need more time to prove this. Um, Lan Zong, I want to ask you this question. Ha, is China now very interesting. Is we all say this company is going to go international. We all say this is going to be international. We all say this is going to be international. We all say this is going to be international. We all say this is going to be international. We all say this is going to be international. We all say this is going to be international. We all say this is going to be international. We all say this is going to be international. 
新能源公司的数据，我觉得这个像光伏公司，比如你们，已经大概有百分之五十以上的订单都是在海外了，所以你们是很早期就真正做到了这个国际化。呃，我想问问看您，在这个国际化的路线当中，呃，在贸易战。和这个整个的全球的贸易竞合关系当中，你们会碰到一些什么样的具体问题？这是第一个。第二个，其实我也很关心啊，就是作为一个中国本土的企业，它怎么在全球招揽人才，然后吸引更多的人才来更好的服务好你们这个全球网络？我用英文翻译一下哈。Um, we were thinking that internet companies or in internet industry um, globally is probably a most mo most globalized industry because a lot of people they have the language skill and internet is also a global infrastructure. But now, if we look at the new energy sector, uh, for instance, solar sector and and, and wind turbine sector. Um, they are actually much more globalized in terms of revenue contribution. More than 50% of the revenue contribution in PV sector um, in China is from overseas market. So I'm asking Lan Zhong, how, first of all, um, did they actually encounter any difficulties while trading internationally? For instance, any trade barriers, um, any regulations, any unfair treatment, um, you know, bringing any difficulties for them to conduct business internationally? And secondly, how do they retain talents to make sure Um, the company always have the good people. First of all, in the PV industry, China entered into the PV industry by learning from others. Since 2006, we have been investing in PV products, and most of our PV products used to be sold overseas. Now, almost 70 percent of the terminal products of PV were from overseas. So, even though PV belongs to the manufacturing sector, speaking of uh, the product nature, it belongs to the energy sector. It can provide the international community with greener energy choice. And this is uh, the shared interest of all governments. And in the manufacturing sector, China is inevitably a big manufacturer, and China is very competitive in manufacturing. The past 16 years of development testify that uh, why PV is booming here now in China globally. Almost 85 percent of the PV industry, be it in terms of uh, battery or components or raw materials, they are very developing well. And if all of those resources were put in one country, that's going to be problematic in terms of the supply chain. Now, many Chinese PV companies are also going globally by building factories overseas. Some of them are very integrated factories. Some are technology-based, which can be very professional. And what's the goal of uh, going global? That is to be in alignment with the other competitors globally. For example, after all, in the future, maybe no later than 2030, there will be one gigawatts of uh, installed capacity every year. And we have to plan our presence in all continents, covering production and battery, and we must think about that ahead of time. And also geographical conflicts are still with us, especially ever since the Ukrainian-Russian conflict. The need for PV installed capacity have to be determined also by the location and also the value distribution of those related uh, PV products in different countries. And as to the performance of PV, in the next one decade, it's going to be very competitive industry. Why? Because the industry is still scaling up every year. It grows by about 30 percent. So it's still on an unclining trend, and for such an industry, it can compete with the other existing industries, and it can even occupy more markets from the fossil fuels. 
in terms of uh, the stored capacity and the new competitive advantages, more resources will lead more okay, towards um, Lan Zong actually didn't uh, touch um, too much on these uh, barriers um, to entering, um, you know, international markets. But I earlier spoke to Hanning Schultz, and he gave us his thoughts um, on the difficulties that he encountered while doing global trade and, and how they are mitigating this. Let's take a listen. First of all, currently, the biggest barrier, obviously, is to the U.S. Um, and to the U.S., um, no Chinese modules or Chinese-produced modules are being shipped, but um, those are being produced um, outside of China. Um, to most, apart from India, to most other countries or big markets, currently, it's quite open. Um, mm -hmm. However, um, we also all know that um, the EU will look more closely at um, at points such as the supply chain. So I think for a manufacturer, what we have to do um, and what we can do and what we are doing is A, to diversify our global production bases, um, which obviously is also something, you know, which we've been seeing in other industries anyway. Um, mm -hmm. The second one also is um, to very clearly know what the requirements are um, and also for Chinese production to, to comply with these um, requirements. So, um, yeah, it is, um, it is um, a point just to be compliant with the requirements and compliance um, will play a major role in the future, as it always has. Yes. Um, and again, also for compliance or in order to be compliant, um, back to the first question, or back to the second question, I think it was a vertically integrated um, supply chain or vertical integration um, helps a lot. Right. Uh, so, you know, that's uh, Henning uh, Schultz's view. Marjin, what do you think um, these restrictive measures imposed by the U.S. government will impact uh, the supply chain or uh, the industry of Chinese PV sector? Yeah, I think you know, with the with the current uh, geopolitical tension uh, uh, going on, and um, and the prospect for this uh, uh, is that uh, th this will uh, probably get worse before it get better. So I think all the uh, industries uh, have to uh, really uh, really pr be prepared for that. And uh, and, and I uh, happy to to hear uh, from. Uh, you know the uh, Xieshin, uh, guests from Xieshin, you know, talking about uh, uh, their their planning and their uh, preparation for that. I think it's uh, it's very important for them to uh, uh, to 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 get ready. And uh, with us, uh, the uh, you know we have been engaged by some uh, uh, some of this uh, local uh, manufacturers and local suppliers as well. And you know they concern about the. Uh, the, the the barriers that uh, the uh, border uh, adjustment tax on the on the carbon emission, you know, they concern that one day um, uh, that uh, this will become a, a trade barrier. And um, uh, I think they uh, uh, in Europe, in America, you know, policies are uh, and, and and legislation being made on that. So we're trying to help uh, develop the. Uh, a proper uh, uh, assessment tool and um, uh, uh, digital accounting platform, which can help them to uh, to 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 measure and uh, uh, and 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 report a carbon footprint, uh, which uh, uh, could be aligned with the uh, with the requirement, for example, in in Europe. Um, and then we are talking about the U.S. regulations, the particular U.S. restrictions to Chinese module exporters to the U.S. market. Uh, can you please explain to us how will that impact the PV industry in China in general? Yeah, I think I think the uh, you know all this uh, all these restrictions, uh, um, you know, particularly those uh, uh, based more on the. Uh, geopolitical concerns uh, uh, will not be helpful, and uh, to us, you know, we uh, uh, we oppose that. And we hope that uh, 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 that we can uh, all, uh, you know, eventually uh, help to this industry 
uh, to be uh, uh, to enjoy a free market competition. Right. And uh, uh, I think this is extremely important uh, uh, to the global fighting against uh, climate change. As uh, eventually, you know, if we want to really achieve the target set by uh, Paris Agreement, uh, uh, we or we need, uh, if we really want to achieve zero carbon emission, then uh, renewable energy is uh, is the, uh, the the key for that. Right. Um, Manti, let me ask you this question. Uh, now we see more and more companies in the solar sector, uh, they're moving into a integrated business model. So everyone is becoming an integrated player. Why is that? Um, shouldn't the division of labor bring us uh, the best efficiency? Uh, yeah, so I think there are mainly two reasons uh, to us. Firstly, I think it's more for uh, a branding perspective. So China is origin, uh, already the global leader in manufacturing in the wind turbines, solar panel, EVs, EV batteries. Um, we estimate that China runs more than 50% of uh, global wind production, 70% um, of solar production and 60% of EV and over 70% of lithium batteries. Um, but most importantly, um, I think uh, being more integrated, it helps to improve the global brand image, uh, moving from only made in China to a more stronger position uh, for, for the branding um, and also to help China uh, 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 companies to penetrate more into the global. Right. Uh, secondly, we think the uh, vertical integration will help uh, smooth volatility and also potentially lower long-term costs um, mm -hmm. as well. So, um, like I take uh, lithium, lithium battery as an example, the lithium prices were up nearly 10 times uh, in, the, in the past two years. And a lot of the companies, including like CACL, they have been integrating into lithium mines to help to, uh, uh, to, to help to lower the prices and lower the volatility. Similarly for the uh, solar industry as well. So uh, by integrating upstream and also downstream, that would help to uh, resolve or lower the volatility in the more long run. Thank right. you. Um, 蓝总，您是怎么看这个？就是大家都往一体化上走的这这个这这个事儿哈？就原来大家可能要不就是呃做这个呃拉筋的，要不就是做组件的，要不就是做玻璃的。现在好像大家都在往一体化上走，这是为什么呢？嗯、呃，首先往一体化走是历史上往一体化能够最。Is also a precondition historically for us to join this cycle. Previously in the market, our profits may be contradictory, but being integrated, we can have a larger room of being squeezed out. After all, this market is getting bigger. And uh, there has been increment every year in the market. So by being integrated, uh, we can be more compatible in this one cycle. And in the end, while we are scaling up, this trend is not sustainable. One day, the PV industry or the daily install capacity will be saturated. Then, better quality and more innovation and uh, better R&D will be more competitive if you are in those efforts. And in the end, the products in the world will have higher quality and lower cost. If you can realize that, you can be compatible with the trend in the world. All parties must provide better quality products. So integration in the short term is trendy. And if you look at the other industries as a comparable, like the automobile, or the semiconductors, they haven't been totally integrated. In the end, they just turn themselves to be more competitive. I'm just asking uh, Mr. Lan, how is Xiexing prepared on the energy storage front going forward? Right now, in the field of energy storage, Xiexing is planning 
ourselves. We have many lithium and other raw material bottlenecks in Xiexi. We haven't mounted up to a higher level. For example, uh, we are not there yet to improve efficiency. So we are just working very hard to acquire those like lithium, and other raw materials and packaging systems. And we plan that by 2023, we will have four gigawatts of energy storage in the front end. Right, uh, Matty, how important in your view is energy storage to this whole industry? Yes, I think energy storage is very important, especially after the recent global energy crisis that you have seen. Uh, the global gas prices shoot up a few times, coal prices were up a lot as well. And at the same time, uh, the solar and wind has its own shortage in terms of stability. So to help this, uh, power storage uh, is one of a very important way. And to be honest, China has paid a lot of attention in power storage uh, fronts right. from both the lithium battery and the normal uh, power storage as well. And, and our power storage capacity in in the past few years has also been leading the, uh, the globe as well. But it's still far from enough when we are comparing the storage capacity versus uh, Europe. And I believe that would be another very fast growing area in the renewable side. Thank right. You. Um, you know, today we don't really have time to touch up on the hydrogen, but earlier I spoke to Li Lianrong, uh, who is managing the hydrogen business of CPIC. And uh, b below is what he told us on the hydrogen development in China and his insight in the industry. In the future, hydrogen power will be applied in four sectors. First of all, as part of the chemical raw materials, hydrogen is widely applied. And secondly, it's going to be applied in the maternity sector. And thirdly, the scenario is about transportation and fourthly, power. So hydrogen power will be used in power generation even in CHP. In addition, a very minority scenario of application is health. Hydrogen can have the functionalities. For example, if you inhale some hydrogen into your respiratory system, it has certain antioxidant effect. So it's going to be applied. We we'll have to stop here today. Um, we are apparently leading the global renewable energy development in China, and we are on our way of a, a great and important, significant green revolution. So until next time, see you again.